Hi everyone. Today I'll be sketching a few moment related images based on two Vayansons illustrations in her book Moomin Land Midwinter. And while I draw, I'll read you a chapter from the book. It's not the whole chapter because it's 30 pages, but it's the part where Moomin Troll meets the ancestor who's one of my favorite moving characters. Let me know if you like this type of video and want me to make a series of drawing and reading videos like this one. Also, if you'd prefer just listening to the drawing sounds, I can make a no-talking version of this video. Now, let's read. Chapter 4 The Lonely and the Run Tutiki is fishing under the ice. Tutiki was sitting under the ice with her fishing rod. She liked the sea's habit of sinking a bit now and then. At those times, she could easily climb down through a hole by the landing stage and seat herself on a boulder to fish. Then one had a nice green ceiling of ice overhead and the sea at one's feet. A black door and a green ceiling, both stretching away into the darkness. Beside Tultiki lay four small fish. One more and she'd have her soup. Suddenly she heard impatient steps coming nearer on the landing stage. Up there, Moomin Troll rapped at the bathing house door. He waited a moment and then knocked again. Ho! Oh, shouted Tutiki. I'm under the ice. The echo raised its head somewhere to the left of her and shouted ho. Oh. It went sliding back and forth several times and cried under the ice. After a while, Moomin Troll's snout cautiously appeared in the opening. His ears were decorated with limp gold ribbons. He looked at the steaming black water and at Tutiki's four fish. He shivered and said, well, he didn't come. Who didn't? asked Tutiki. The sun, cried Moomin Troll. The sun, repeated Diego. Sun, sun, sun. Further and further off, weaker and weaker. Tutiki hauled on her line. Don't be in such a hurry, she said. He's been coming on this day every year, so probably he'll do it now again. Pull up your snout so I can come out of here. Tutiki clambered up to the surface and sat down on the bathing house steps. She sniffed lightly and listened. Then she said, Soon now, sit down and wait. Little Mai came skating over the ice and sat down beside them. She had tied thin lids under her shoes for better speed. So, here we are waiting for something wonderful again, she said. Not that I wouldn't like a little daylight. Two old crows came flapping from the wood and alighted on the roof of the bathing house. The minutes passed. Then all at once the fluff on Moomin Troll's back bristled and in great excitement he saw a red light gathering on the dusty sky just over the horizon. It thickened to a narrow red sliver of fire that threw long red rays of light along the ice. There he is, cried Moomin Troll. He lifted little Mai in his arms and kissed her smack on the nose. Golly, what a fuss, said little Mai. What's all this to make such a noise about? Of course, cried Moomin Troll. Spring, warmth. Everybody will wake up. How splendid. He took the four fish and threw them high into the air. He stood on his head. 
He had never felt so happy in his life. And then the eyes became dark again. The crows took off and went slowly flapping over the shore. Tuti gathered up her fishes and the little red strip had hidden itself under the horizon. Did he change his mind? Moomintral asked, horrified. No wonder after taking a peep at you, said little Mai and skated off on her thin lids. He'll return tomorrow, replied Tuutiki. And then he'll be a tiny bit bigger, about like a piece of a cheese rind. Take it easy. And Tuutiki crept back under the ice to fill her soup kettle with seawater. Of course, she was right. It can't be done in a trice for a sun to appear in the sky. But you won't be less disappointed just because other people are right and you are not. Moomintral sat down staring down at the ice and suddenly he felt that he was becoming angry. It started down in his tummy like all strong feelings. He felt that somebody had pulled his leg. And he felt a fool for having made such a noise and tied gold ribbons around his ears. That made him angrier still. Finally, he felt that he had to do something really terrible and forbidden to be able to calm down again, and at once. He started to his feet, ran over to the landing stage and into the bathing house. He went straight to the cupboard and threw the door wide open. There hung the bath gowns. There lay the rubber hemulen that wasn't quite airtight just as they had been last summer. But on the floor, a grey little thing was sitting and staring at him, very hairy and grey and snouty. Then it came to life and whisked past him like a trot and disappeared. He saw its tail slide out through the chink at the bathing house door like a piece of black string. The tuft caught for a fleeting moment but was pulled free and then the beast was gone. Tutiki came in with the kettle between her paws and said, So you couldn't keep from opening the door? There was only a sort of old rat, Moomin Troll replied surreally. That was no rat, said Tutiki. It was a troll, a troll of the kind you were yourself before you became a Moomin. That was how you looked a thousand years ago. Moomin Troll found no reply. He went home and sat down in the drawing room to think. After a while, little Mai dropped in to borrow some candles and sugar. I hear terrible things about you, she said happily. They say you've been letting your own forefather out of the cupboard. You resemble each other, I hear. Shut up, please, said Moomin Troll. He went up to the attic and found the family album. Page after page of dignified Moomins, most often reproduced standing in front of porcelain stoves or on fretworked verandas. Not a single one of them resembled the cupboard troll. Must be a mistake, Moomin Troll thought. He can't be any relation of mine. He went down and looked at his sleeping daddy. Only the snout bore some resemble to the trolls. But possibly a thousand years ago? The cut glass chandelier started jingling. It was slowly swaying back and forth and something was moving about inside the gauze. Something small and hairy. A long black tail was hanging straight down among the prisms. There he is, Moomin Troll murmured. My ancestor has set himself up in the chandelier. But now this didn't seem so very bad. Moomin Troll was getting accustomed to the bewitched time of winter. How are you? he asked softly. The troll looked at him through the gauze and wiggled its ears. Be careful with the chandelier, Moomin Troll continued. It's a family piece. 
The troll tilted its head and looked intently at him, obviously trying to listen. Now he is going to speak, thought Moomin Troll. All at once he felt terribly afraid that his ancestor might try to tell him something. What if he spoke some foreign language like the little beast with the eyebrows? If he became angry and said Radamsa or something? And then they'd perhaps never be friends afterwards. Shh, whispered Moomin Troll. Don't say anything. Perhaps they were related after all. And relatives who come on a visit may stay for any length of time. If it's an ancestor, he may stay forever. Who can tell? If one weren't careful, he might misunderstand one and be angry. And then the family would have to live with an angry ancestor all their lives. Shh, repeated Moomin Troll. Shh. The ancestor jingled the prism slightly, but said nothing. I'll show him about the house, Moomin Troll thought. That's what mother would have done if a relative had come for a visit. He took the lamp and held it before a beautiful hand-painted picture called Filiong at the window. The troll looked at it and shrugged his shoulders. Moomin Troll went to the plush sofa. He showed the troll all the chairs one by one the drawing room mirror and the Mersham tram, everything of beauty and value that the Mumi family possessed. The troll looked attentively at it all, but it was clear that it didn't understand the use of the things. Finally, Mumi drew sighed and placed the lamp on the mantelpiece. But this caught the troll's interest very strongly. It dropped down from the chandelier and went scuttling round the porcelain stove like a little grey bundle of rags. It stuck its head inside the shutters and sniffed at the ashes. It showed great curiosity in the embroidered cord that hung from the damper and nosed for a long time in the cranny between stove and wall. It must be true then, Moomin Joel thought agitatedly. We are related because mothers always told me that our forebears lived behind stoves. At that moment, the alarm clock went off. Moomin Troll used to have it ring at dusk, because that was the time when he longed most for company. The troll stiffened visibly, and then it whisked inside the stove in a cloud of ashes. A moment later, it started rattling the damper in no very friendly way. Moomin Troll shut off the alarm clock and listened with a thumping heart. But nothing else was to be heard. A few specks of soot came falling down the chimney and the damper cord was swaying. Moomin Troll went out on the roof to calm himself. Well, how'd you like grandfather? Little Mai shouted from her sled slide. An excellent person. Moomin Troll remarked with dignity. In an old family like ours, people know how to behave. Suddenly, he felt very proud of having an ancestor. And it cheered him no little to think that little Mai had no pedigree at all, but rather had come into the world by chance. That night, Moomin Troll's ancestor rearranged the house quietly enough, but with surprising strength. In the morning he had turned the sofa towards the porcelain stove and hung all the pictures anew. Those that he liked the least he had hung upside down. Or perhaps they were those that he thought best of, who knows. Not a single piece of furniture stood in its old place, and the alarm clock lay in the slop pail. Indeed, he had carried down a heap of old junk from the attic and piled it high around the stove. Tootiki came over to look. I believe he's done that to feel more at home, she said and rubbed her nose. He's tried to build himself a nice thicket around his house so that he can be left alone. 
But what will mother say? said Moomin Troll. Tootiki shrugged her shoulders. Well, why did you have to let him out? she said. In any case, this troll never eats anything. Very practical for him and for you. You'll have to think the whole matter's fun, I suppose. Moomin Troll nodded. He thought for a while. Then he crawled inside the thicket of broken chairs, empty boxes, fishing nets, cardboard tubes, old baskets and gardening tools. Very soon he discovered that it was a cozy kind of place. He decided to sleep the night in a basket of wool that stood under a useless rocking chair. As a matter of fact, he had never felt really secure in the dim lit drawing room with its empty windows. And to look at the sleeping family made him melancholy. But here, in the small space between a packing case, the rocking chair, and the back of the sofa, he felt at ease and not at all lonely. He could see a little of the blackness inside the stove, but he was careful not to disturb his ancestor, and built walls around his nest as quietly as he could. In the evening, he took the lamp there with him and lay for a while, listening to the ancestors rustling in the chimney. Perhaps I lived like this a thousand years ago, Moomin Troll thought happily. He half thought of shouting something up to the chimney, just a word of secret concord. But then he thought better of it. He blew out his lamp and curled up deep in the wall. <laughs>